This podcast is brought to you by the good people at Living with Hemophilia, the online hemophilia community brought to you by Bayer. Living with Hemophilia is the destination of choice for a plethora of useful info, like medical and non-medical tips, helpful advice, information on programs for all ages and stages, leadership opportunities and initiatives, sewing patterns, and videos, the best videos. And because it's on the internet, it's easy to find. Simply type in livingwithhemophilia.com into your search bar. And there you are. Thank you, internet. Join Bayer's community of fellow hemophilia patients, caregivers, and advocates as they put the live in Living with Hemophilia. You can even like them on Facebook. That's even better because then you can use emojis on their Facebook page and receive all the latest updates. So check out Living with Hemophilia. And before you wish happy birthday to some friend from the third grade or share a funny meme about cats and Mondays, Head over to Facebook and like Bayer's Living with Hemophilia page. You'll be glad you did. This past December, leaders in medical research met in Atlanta, Georgia for the 59th annual American Society of Hematology meeting. This year, there were dozens of submissions involving hemophilia and gene therapy and progress reports of the clinical trials going on around the world. But what do we really know about gene therapy? And how will this transform the bleeding disorders community? Today's episode of Ask the Expert We will be diving deep into these questions and so much more. Welcome to episode 13, our gene therapy episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bombardier, and I'm extremely excited to have the director of the University of Colorado Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center, Dr. Marilyn Minko Johnson, here to help us better understand gene therapy. Not only has Marilyn been the director of the University of Colorado Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center for almost 30 years, she has also been a leader in research within the bleeding disorder community with dozens, maybe even hundreds of publications to her name. Her most well-known study is the Joint Outcome Study that focused on the protective effects of prophylactic treatment on joints of kids with hemophilia A, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And she's actually been my hematologist for the last 30 years of my life. So thank you, Marilyn, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. To start off, I know that that introduction was just the tip of the iceberg for your experience in hemophilia. Can you just kind of give us a little brief rundown of what your experience has been in the clinic and in research? My experience has been directly at treating people. We have the good fortune that our clinic is at cradle to grave, and we have newborn babies up to our oldest patient. has been 99 years old. So we uh, follow patients through all phases of the lifespan, and I have been interested in detecting uh, adverse outcomes and uh, preventive techniques, and then, of course, treatments to uh, ameliorate problems uh, should they arise, and looking at the special needs of babies, school children, young adults, middle-aged adults, and the elderly with hemophilia. My research has been in prevention and different ways of using prophylaxis to prevent joint and other bleeding, and starting with very young children and then showing that the beneficial effects of this, even on teenagers, young adults, and even middle-aged adults who haven't had the opportunity to present the early problems. We have a clinic is structured as a prospective cohort. So we ask everyone that joins our clinic, would they join our cohort and let us use just the, your story, what's happened to you in life, what good and what less good events have befallen you, what, what treatment you use, what complications and positive outcomes we've come. And we are also trying to develop global assays that can predict the effects of treatment so that we can kind of get a jump ahead in our clinical trials of of picking the right trial for the right person. Awesome. And you've been at the treatment center in Colorado since I was like two years old. You did your fellowship there and everything? Well, I came in 1974 as an intern and I did a pediatric internship and residency, then a fellowship. And then I became a junior faculty member in hematology with Dr. William Hathaway, who is a very famous and very distinguished hematologist who actually started up the first pediatric blood clotting lab and started the uh, hemophilia treatment center in 1974 when I had just arrived. I worked with him on faculty from 1980. 82 to 1989, when he wanted to retire and asked me to take his uh, position as director of the center. And actually, when I was an intern, Dr. Hathaway called me and said, well, I saw in your application for internship that you're interested in leukemia. And uh, hemophilia likes leukemia, just a little bit different. Why don't you come to our co-ed conferences? And, and why don't you come and talk to us about the work we do? So I started getting involved with the hemophilia community and the laboratory assays and, and the treatments for hemophilia way back in 74, when we were just starting to get the first phase of concentrates made from plasma derivatives. Actually, my very first day as a faculty member in 1982, we had a 19-year-old uh, gentleman 
who had an unusual pneumonia that turned out to be pneumocystis. And when we were puzzled by the setting of why he got this, we uh, involved the CDC and they were able to link him with one individual in California and one elsewhere, I think New York, as three people in the country who developed an unusual infection where their only link was using clotting factor. And that was the first evidence that the HIV virus that we didn't even know about at that time well, could be harbored in plasma derivatives. So early in my career, I became immersed in the unknown, in, in having unknown complications and illness and, and helping sort that out. So, you know, I was very grateful to be part of the community and in weathering those times. And it's kind of, a, a, it makes it a double thrill, having gone through all of the sorrow and discovery about HIV and treatments and making it a very manageable chronic disease, we came with a lot of enthusiasm and optimism into prophylaxis and then gene therapy saying we can go even many steps further in hemophilia. Yeah, so you just mentioned gene therapy, which is our main topic for today. So I remember going to the treatment center when I was a kid and there was talk about gene therapy and maybe in 10 years that will be a possibility. But before we get into like the history of it, what is gene therapy and how does it work? Okay, gene therapy is actually a diverse set of treatments for genetic disorders that attempts either to take the normal gene and introduce it into a person's body or to repair the mutation that the person carries in it within his own genetic material. In its fullest potential, gene therapy therapy offers a chance that a person who's unable to make a certain protein because of a faulty gene will be able to produce that protein on his own and not need ongoing replacement therapy. I will take one little side to say that the very first gene therapy attempt for hemophilia was performed in Colorado in the 1970s. And we had a young surgeon, Tom Starzl, who later became very, very famous for his work in transplant therapy. And he actually helped us transplant spleens in children with hemophilia with the idea that the spleen would be a site to make factor eight. And at that time, we didn't understand about organ rejection and the spleens were rejected. But in the transient time that the spleen was grafted into a child and the functioning, it did make factor eight for the person. And so we actually contributed the first proof of concept that you could put a, a gene from a donor person into the body of someone with hemophilia and produce factor eight. And that, that went dormant and uh, transplantation went into kidneys and livers and bone marrow for a long time. And we're now just cycling back to factor eight about 50 years later. Wow, that's so interesting. I had no idea. How are they actually inserting that gene or repairing the gene now? So most gene therapy is taking a normal gene and getting a method to put that into the body. The most common technique for the gene therapy trials that are up and running use a viral vector. And what that is, is taking a virus, general, initially the AAV virus, which are a very wimpy family of cold viruses, which make an individual very minimally ill and taking that the DNA of that virus or the RNA and stripping it of any proteins that the virus could use to duplicate itself, to replicate, and just using the protein uh, structure as a bag to bring the gene into the person's body. Now, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just putting the factor eight or nine gene into this viral capsule. You actually put it into a modified gene, which includes some coding for homing so that if you want this gene to be expressed in liver cell, capsid will go to the liver. And then there are other modifications to make it optimally take it into the cell and then replicate it within the cell. A couple things is that that's not the only family of viruses. There are lentiviruses. So adenoviruses only transfect dividing cells and were initially considered a safer approach to gene therapy. Lentiviruses, which are slow replicating viruses of which HIV is in the family, are also a candidate family. And while these were not chosen in the, in the first studies of hemophilia gene therapy, Therapy. They have been used in other ge genetic diseases with a lot of success and probably will be hearing about those gene therapies too. Well, I just want to mention that the viral vector has been the most fully developed and brought the closest in clinical trials, but there are other means of carrying genes into a cell, some which electrochemically makes little holes in the cell and, and pushes the gene into it. So there are many other physical chemical techniques of, of transferring genes that we'll be hearing more about in the future. Oh, wow. I had no idea that there are even techniques being used. That's really interesting. So you've mentioned viruses, and that's kind of the vector to get the gene into the body. And in our community, obviously, we've had experience with viruses in the past, you know, HIV, hepatitis C. Will these viruses have any like effect on the body when you introduce it? Like any negative effect? So that's a great question. 
So this virus is really a diminished virus, a weakened virus, which can only carry the, the gene and cannot replicate. However, it is made of proteins. And if your body has seen that protein in the past, if you had that cold virus in the past, and you have pre-existing antibodies against that, that they can react with the viral vector. The most immediate action of that is it destroys the carrier of your gene therapy and it makes the gene therapy not effective. However, in the early trials of some other genes, it also induced some inflammation of the liver. And because this gene is going into the liver, having the inflammation track the, the, the gene and the vector present inflammation in the liver would be a very bad thing. And so a lot of work is done to screen for that and protect that there's not any bodily immune response against the vector, which would damage the host. The vectors are cleared in about three weeks, and so there's no long-term effect of those viruses. Now, currently, the gene therapies are being constructed so that the genes are not really incorporated into our DNA, but transcribed outside of the DNA, because we don't yet have skillful techniques to put the gene exactly where we want it. Although, again, we're advancing in that area very, very rapidly. So if the gene just inserted itself in any position, in the possibility that it would insert itself by a growth factor, it's possible that the genes could disrupt the normal regulation of growth and cause a tumor or in a developing fetus cause a birth defect. And so there's been a lot of caution and concern about where these genes are inserted and to not have non-selective uh, insertion in, in, into our DNA. Now, that's really more untoward effect of the gene itself rather than the carrier vector. But that's one of the possible long-term effects that we work very hard to avoid. Okay, so you're saying that the gene is just inserted into the cell, but not into the DNA that is existing there. But I've heard of the term like gene editing, gene splicing, and gene transfer. Are all those the same thing? Or are they variants of how this technique is going? And like, which one are we kind of working on right now in clinical trials? So gene transfer would be getting a gene into the body. One other very interesting way of doing it is getting human blood stem cells and putting the gene in that. And for factor eight, that's a particularly interesting way because then the little platelet clotting cells uh, would carry factor eight within it. And when there was an injury and the platelets go to stop the bleeding, they would be carrying factor eight within it and it would be carried exactly to where it was needed, when it was needed to be to function just perfectly. Gene transfer is just transferring the gene into the body. Now, these other two terms talk about another technology. So gene editing is actually just like editing film or editing a recording. You actually edit your own DNA and it can now be targeted to where your factor eight or nine gene is and specifically where the mutation is and a cut can be made across the DNA to actually splice out the mutation and put in a pre-made cassette which contains the proper codes and then by complementary recombination the complementary strand of DNA would also copy the normal recording and repair your gene. So gene editing is a way to repair your own gene rather than having a, a foreign uh, correct gene brought in. Gene splicing has to do with that technique to cut the DNA, cut out the mutation, and put in a cassette with the proper sequence for the DNA. It's very much Star Wars and very close to, to being now. Interesting. If you go in to get gene therapy, how is it delivered? Is it like an infusion or is it different? And like, what were like process the gene therapy? What does that look like? The gene therapy that we're doing in most of the clinical trials is really very undramatic and maybe anticlimactic. It's a simple <laughs> IV in the elbow and it's a little push just like a single factor eight or factor nine infusion. So it is not very glitzy. There have been some other techniques. There was, uh, there were previously, uh, and the first attempt was with muscle gene therapy, where with factor nine, the gene was put in many, many little needles into the calf muscles. And it was felt to be, uh, and there it was felt when you're running, when you're active and need the, the, the factor, the gene would just make the protein and puts it out into the bloodstream. But that was too traumatic because it was too many pokes. Another uh, technique that, that really might come back again were uh, skin cells. Skin cells were transfected with the factor nine gene and put in a semi-permeable membrane package, so a plastic bag, and just put in the belly and under the muscle and soft tissue of the belly with the idea that the belly could provide all the nutrition and fluids to nourish these cells. And when they made factor nine, it would just weep out of the bag. The pores were small enough that the immune cells could not get in there to kill the cells. Really, they're, they're, the sky is uh, very open and unlimited with all the possibilities for gene therapy. 
This podcast is brought to you by the good people at Living with Hemophilia, the online community brought to you by Bayer. Living with Hemophilia is the destination of choice for a plethora of useful info like medical and non-medical tips, helpful advice, information on programs for all ages and stages, leadership opportunities and initiatives, sewing patterns, and videos, the best videos. And because it's on the internet, it's easy to find. Simply type livingwithhemophilia.com into your search bar and there you are. Thank you, internet. Join Bayer's community of fellow hemophilia patients, caregivers, and advocates as they put the live in living with hemophilia. You can even like them on Facebook, and that's even better because then you can use emojis on their Facebook page and receive all the latest updates. So, check out Living with Hemophilia. And before you wish happy birthday to that friend from third grade or share a funny meme about cats and Mondays, head over to Facebook and like Bayer's Living with Hemophilia page. You'll be glad you did. Who would be eligible to receive gene therapy or gene transfer in the future? And would having hepatitis C or HIV preclude you from receiving it? Or is there age limits? Is there anything that prevents people from being eligible for this? So right now, the eligibility is generally adults 18 years or older and individuals who have never had a history of an inhibitor, but I'll come back to that, and who have a bleeding phenotype so that they either require prophylaxis or they do have a certain number of bleeds a year. Because in every new procedure, you have a risk and a benefit, and you shouldn't take on the risk unless you're a potential to get a great benefit. Now, in the future, there is an idea that this could be a very good therapy for people with inhibitors because what happens with a vector is it carries the gene into your liver and it goes into the cells and into the nucleus of the cell, but most of it is not incorporated into the DNA. The gene will then code for the protein to be made and secrete it from that cell into the bloodstream at a continuous rate. So you will now continuously be putting your own factor eight or nine into the bloodstream and you'll have a steady level. You won't have the peaks and troughs. So if you have an inhibitor, this constant exposure to factor eight would be like being on super immune tolerance. With immune tolerance, we can only give factor eight to tolerate the person once or twice a day. This would be a continuous process and theoretically should be a, a big help in tolerance. Now with HIV, you know, now is a chronic disease and anyone who is on HIV therapies would be able to keep that virus in control and would be a candidate for gene therapy. So it's only individuals whose immune system is so damaged with less than 200 uh, CD4 cells that this procedure might be a little dangerous. Also with hep C, since there's a very highly effective therapies that will kill the hep C virus in more than 98% of people. Anyone who's had hep C therapy and has stable liver function is a candidate. So that would be overwhelmingly the majority of people with hemophilia who have ever had HIV or hep C. So that's a great thing is that very, very few people will be excluded. So you just mentioned a, a CD4 cell. Could you just mention what that is in general? Foreign proteins, like proteins of the HIV virus, are in the body. Certain cells present them to the immune system. And then the CD4 cells actually communicate with those immune cells that actually make the antibodies. Unfortunately, the HIV virus attacks and lives in the CD4 cells themselves. And so over time, it, it kills and erodes the number and function of these cells so that your ability to have the immune system communicate is greatly weakened. And that's why people with HIV can be prone to infections and, and infections with bugs that are usually very wimpy and don't hurt most of us. The current HIV drugs are so effective that the immune system can be maintained or brought back in the vast majority of people. You know, now that we kind of know what gene therapy is and what it means, what are kind of the potential benefits for the gene therapy according to these new studies? Also, you know, what are the potential like pitfalls or risks with this new treatment? This is the holy grail. This could be a cure. So there are dogs in North Carolina that have been cured of hemophilia for over 10 years. This could restore your factor eight or nine levels to normal. It could last an indefinite period of time. Alternatively, it could work very well, but not last permanently. And you may need a, a retreatment of some kind after some period of time. In the dogs, that's not happened. There are humans who have had a stable a gene reconstitution for up to four years. So we just don't know how long it can last, but it could be a real cure for the first time. What are the pit pitfalls? The pitfalls are that you could lose a gene over years, that you'd have to get a retreat. And at this time, you cannot be retreated with the same vector you had initially. You would have to be retreated with a different type. Having it not work 
or working and then losing effect would be the biggest pitfall. Which uh, kind of leads me right to my next question. So for factor therapy, you feel like one of your products isn't working very well. You can just switch to another one. So for gene therapy, if you get this gene therapy, one treatment, and it doesn't seem to be working well, is there a possibility of trying one or does it have to be like a completely different vector in order to do that? You would have to try a different gene therapy, but the leaders in our field of gene therapy, like Kathy High, are very optimistic that they will be developing immune treatments to allow you a retreatment with one vector that was previously successful. The pitfall is that right now we can't exactly regulate how much gene we get. The therapies have been pretty consistent. So using the human normal factor 9 gene, most studies have gotten people somewhere between 4 and 10%, which has been a very consistent improvement, but not a cure. Now, recently, a mutated factor 9 that was found in Italy in the city of Padua, which gives you a factor 9, which has eight times the power of the normal factor 9 molecule, it has been adapted to gene therapy. So if you could reliably get 6%, 6 percent, 6 times 8 is 48 percent, and you would be actually near the lower limit of normal. And so with the Padua gene, it looks like factor 9 will be able to, to get to a very normal level. With factor eight, it's been not so consistent. And within some of the very good gene therapy trials, some individuals come out as a mild hemophilia patient, and some have come out with 200% factor eight or higher. We know in the normal population, the range of factor eight ranges from 50 to 250. So we know that it's a disadvantage to be too low and it's for bleeding, and it's a disadvantage to be too high for heart attacks and blood clots. And we do know that a lot of the regulation of the factor eight level is not in your factor eight gene, but something outside the eight gene that we don't totally understand. Big discussion is how much, with factor eight, how much should we give and should we undershoot to avoid people having risk of blood clots or heart attacks or strokes when they're older. Right. Wouldn't it be very ironic to go from bleeding too much to clotting too much? Yes, it would be very, very ironic. My next question is, what does gene therapy mean for factor going forward? Will factor replacement still have a part of our treatment or will we not even have to think about factor or will we not know yet? For an individual who would say have a gene therapy and come out with a 100% factor level, they're normal. They shouldn't ever need any, any factor again. For an individual that came out 20%, they might be 90% normal and not bleed during day-to-day -day life. But if they had a major surgery or they had a major car wreck, they may need some factor to you know, once in a great while. So uh, there's a whole range of outcomes regarding factor. In the normal range, you would not need it. Would patients, so say they get this gene transfer, they're in the normal level, would they still be going to the treatment center once a year to get their levels checked and see how things are going? Or what would that relationship look like between patients and HTCs if this is successful? Well, I think we would have to follow individuals until we know how well it lasts and how long it lasts and what happens when you get challenged with a trauma or, or with a surgery. And it may be that we'll find at some point that one does not need to come. We do have an experience. We have individuals who had hepatitis C with or without HIV who developed liver failure and required a liver transplant. And those individuals ended up having a normal factor eight or nine level and having their hemophilia cured. And they had to follow up on their liver transplant, but, but not with us. And my experience has been for the first few years, they wanted to come back and say, I'm still part of the family. Eventually they realized is that your liver is working and making their factor and they just don't need to come. Because it's a genetic disease, of course, we will want to keep up with families and helping to diagnose and support new babies when they're born. So we don't want to mm -hmm. completely lose track of our families. Right. So one of the last questions I have is, we know that the cost for this treatment is probably going to be extremely, extremely high. How do you think insurance companies will cover this treatment or, or do you think they actually will? Well, it's all speculative right now. And, you know, the process yeah. is that a company doesn't even discuss any possible pricing until the, they have an FDA approval. And we're a few years away from an FDA approval. But rumors and hypothetical talking has said maybe, you know, since hemophilia is often two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 a year, maybe a gene therapy would cost a million dollars. Well, nobody has a million dollars to put out for a gene therapy. And what I've heard that multiple pharmaceutical companies are looking at, and this is not just in hemophilia, but metabolic diseases, some, some retinal diseases, is that they're looking for the equivalent of a mortgage, amortizing it over a number of years and saying like, well, 
it's going to cost a million dollars, but could we take payment from the insurance company at so much a year? There are certainly some hurdles because I think giving a product, if a pharmaceutical company gave you a gene therapy, you don't pay the years down the line. I don't think they can come and take your product back. And insurance companies have not historically been really happy about picking up the bills of patients who have been on other plans. In the long run, this is going to revolutionize health. It's going to be a better treatment. It's going to be better patient quality of life, better health. And ultimately, it is going to be less expensive. So I feel very optimistic that while it's very challenging, we're going to come up with some brand new economic model to fund it. And I don't think funding in the U.S. will be the barrier. Certainly in many parts of the world, it's going to take time before they can afford it. But for us, it's efficacy and safety. And once we know something is safe and it's likely to work, we're going to say yes. And when you say it's a cure, when you have children, though, you'll still pass on the mutated gene, correct? So if I have a daughter, she'll be a carrier and she is a grandson. Will he still have to receive? the gene therapy when he's born, will that still progress? Right. So there is experience in some other particular immune deficiency diseases where gene transfer was used that actually incorporated into the gene. And because of that issue with growth factors and growth promoters, it actually uh, did stimulate some cases of leukemia. And so right now, there are a lot of attempts to not only keep the gene from incorporating into the germ cells, but actually actively preventing it. So we do know that while the active homing of the gene, so the gene comes to live in the liver and make factor in the liver, but initially it's in body fluids and tissues, including semen, and that's checked very carefully. And it clears in about three weeks. And there's a lot of effort to make sure it's not in the sperm cells so that it, it would not have the potential of causing a birth defect or tumor in, in a developing baby. And at this time, then yes, uh, children would have to get their own gene therapy at the right time when they're old enough. In the future, I'm sure we will come up with ways. So gene editing and, and gene repair gets around that problem. You do not have mm-hmm. any risk to the fetus, and that will be a cure that will be transferred to your children. For the uh, viral yeah. vectors now, uh, in the future maybe, we'll be able to control them so they don't cause any mischief, but at this time, we're not giving a gene therapy to, this, to the germ cells. Okay, interesting. I have one more question. It's kind of more of a personal note. Why did you say yes to me climbing the seven summits, and what were your concerns with that? So I, I can say my concerns for anyone climbing the seven summits is that it's it's a very risky endeavor and fraught with a lot of difficulties and potential disasters. I'm not sure I would have the courage and the fortitude to take on that goal myself. But I said yes to you climbing the seven summits because that was your passion. And I firmly believe that no one has the right to limit or take away the passion of another person. And, and I see my role as, as a physician in hemophilia as giving you information about what risks I could see and any possible way that you could minimize your risk. In your case, extended half-life products and prophylaxis made your climbs a lot safer, but your climb depended on a lot more than factor. I mean, it was your training, your motivation, your ability to communicate with your own body, and then all of the eating, sleeping, and exercising you had to learn for an optimal body and and doing everything you could to minimize the risk of failure. So I I think the goal of hemophilia therapy is level the playing field and support everybody with a bleeding disorder to have and achieve their life passion. And I think, uh, Chris, very, very, very few people are going to have your lion's heart and your courage and strength and ambition to climb the seven summits. But I would hope that like you, they all have a dream and and that they all are able to, to tackle and hopefully accomplish their dream. And that specifically that hemophilia doesn't get in their way. I think it was amazing that you were able to overcome hemophilia. And I think that, that it's a great example of how nobody outside can say what an individual person's capacity or limits are. You can only find that out by, by trying. Thanks, Marilyn. And thank you just so much for encouraging me and believing in me and supporting me on that dream. It was, it was pretty special. And thank you for being a part of this podcast and sharing a little more information about gene therapy and all of the nuances of it. So thank you so much for being on the, on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was truly a pleasure. Have a great day now. Have you checked out Living with Hemophilia yet? If you have, kudos to you. Not only are you eager to join this exciting community of discourse and helpful information, you're also a keen listener and patron of the arts. But if you haven't taken a swim through livingwithhemophilia.com, take a moment to pull it up on the old internet. I think you're going to love it. Helpful content, relevant updates, and most of all, a bunch of people going through the same things you are. It's a growing part of the online Living with Hemophilia community brought together by the good people at Bayer. 
Also, put it on your Facebook to-do list. Hit the like button on Living with Hemophilia's Facebook page. It's a good alternative to looking at the slideshow of your neighbor's recent foot surgery. I mean, unless you're into that sort of thing. Living with Hemophilia from Bayer. Check it out. Thank you once again to Dr. Manko Johnson for taking time out of her busy day to give us the rundown on what gene therapy is and what it means for the future of the bleeding disorders community. I found it particularly interesting that Dr. Manko Johnson was involved in some of the first gene therapy attempts back in the 1970s and is now potentially watching them become a reality in the near future. With that, please remember to always consult with your healthcare provider before trying any new products or treatments. They will have the most up-to-date information and can help you make the best decision for you. I would also love to say thank you to our sponsor, Living with Hemophilia, the online hemophilia community brought to you by Bayer. Living with Hemophilia is the destination of choice for tons of useful information, like medical and non-medical tips, helpful advice, information on programs for all ages and stages, leadership opportunities and initiatives, sewing patterns, and videos. Please visit their website, livingwithhemophilia.com, and like their similarly named Facebook page. And that's all for episode 13 of the Ask the Expert podcast. We'll be back next month with another expert interview. Bloodstreammedia.com is your one-stop shop for all of Bloodstream Media's podcasts for the bleeding disorders community. Once on Bloodstreammedia.com, don't forget to follow the links to subscribe to the Bloodstream podcast, Ask the Expert podcast, the Powering Through podcast, and the Bloodline podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Have an idea for a future episode of Ask the Expert? Have a question that you'd like to hear an expert answer to? Email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You'll also find Bloodstream Media on Facebook.com forward slash Bloodstream Media and on Twitter at Bloodstream Info. This episode of Ask the Expert was written by Chris Bombardier, produced by Patrick James Lynch, Rob Radford, Joshua Sterling Bragg, Avra Friedman, and Colby Crow. Artwork by Ryan Geelan and Katie Wright Mead. And the Ask the Expert pod is edited by Allison Stoney. I'm your host, Chris Bombardier, and until next time, keep on climbing.